If you're here today for the first time, we have started a, a series on called A Life of Peace. Why? We want you, we want everyone a part of Freedom Family Church, we want God's people to experience that, that peace that passes all understanding, that peace that the Bible says guards our minds as we focus on Christ. That, that word guard literally means it's like a, a guard dog that protects us. And so we want you to have that peace that no matter what you're going through, no matter what circumstance, situation that you find yourself in, that you can say, hey, I might not be okay, but I do have God's peace. Things might not be going right, but I do have God's peace. And so last week, we saw that if we want to enjoy the peace of God, then we must have the peace, we must have peace with God. Remember that if you want to have the peace of God, then you must have peace with God. And we saw that one of the reasons why we don't have peace with God is because we love to believe lies about him. It goes all the way back to Eve in the Garden of Eden. Eve believed a lie about God, that God somehow was trying to keep something from her. And so therefore that opened her up to lose the peace that she had. She went from somebody who walked with God, who communed with God, to somebody who hid from God. Maybe that's you today. Maybe today you used to be close to God. Maybe today you used to be tight with God, but you find yourself hiding from God. You find yourself avoiding God. You don't want to read your word. You don't want to pray. You don't want to listen to godly music. Why? Because you've lost your peace with God. And so therefore, you don't have the peace of God. And so let me encourage you, listen to the message that God shared with us last week. It's on our Facebook, our YouTube page. But make sure that you get rid of all the lies that you've believed about God so that you can experience that peace. Because I'm going ahead and tell you, in order to get the peace of God, you're going to have to let him do heart transplant on you. He's going to have to change you from the inside out. And you only let somebody do that, somebody you trust, somebody that you have stopped believing lies about. So let me encourage you to, to remove all the lies from your heart and your life. But today, as we continue this series on a life of peace, why don't we start off with a simple fact? And the fact is this, there's nothing more important to our peace than forgiveness. There's more, nothing more important to our peace than then forgiveness. Even our peace with God was what? We got access to having peace with God. Why? Because Jesus purchased us forgiveness on the cross of Calvary. Well, there's nothing more important. Keep this in your mind. There's nothing more important to our peace than forgiveness. If suddenly today you lose your peace, if suddenly today you get a rumbling in your tumbling, and you're just feeling anxious and you're feeling, you need to start looking for something that you need to forgive. You need to start looking for an area of unforgiveness. Why? Well, notice what Ephesians 4, 31 and 32 says. It says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. So, so what's the opposite of peace? Well, he tells us bitterness and rage and anger, harsh words, slander, and all types of evil behavior. Well, how do we get rid of that which steals our peace? Forgiveness. Forgiveness allows us to get rid of the bad stuff in our life so that we might enjoy the peace of God. Think about it. Those times that you find yourself flying off the handle. Those times you find yourself where you can't keep your mouth shut. You've got to say something hurtful. You've got to say something hateful. Those times you find yourself saying, I can't stand the sight of that person or I can't stand to hear the name of so-and-so. All of those things come from an unforgiving heart. And so if we want peace, then we're going to have to forgive. If we want peace, we're going to have to let forgiveness be a part of our life. But here's the thing. If I took a poll of you, if I stood at that door, I stood at that door. Some of you love to come in different doors. If I stood at all the doors today and I asked everyone that came in here today, hey, are you a forgiving person? All of us would say, yes, pastor. I am such a, you you just wouldn't believe. Have you met my husband? Have you met my children? They're still alive. So obviously, obviously, I'm a forgiving person. Pastor, I am, you know, I can leave now. I don't need this message because I am the most forgiving person that I know. Well, can I share with you the truth? And the truth is this. There's nothing more misunderstood than true forgiveness. There's nothing more misunderstood than true biblical forgiveness. You see, most of us think that we're forgiving people, but most of us are like the people in Proverbs 14, 12. It applies to us today. It says, you may think you're on the right road and still end up dead. So you see, we all think we're forgiving. We all think we know what forgiveness is, yet our dead and dying relationships reveal the truth. Consider this, can you? It broke my heart this week when God reminded me, he revealed to me that I don't know too many people 
in my family. I don't know too many people in my church. I don't know too many people in this community that have deep, amazing relationships. I can probably count on one hand how many people I know that have deep, abiding, wonderful, great, amazing relationships. Have you ever considered the why? Have you ever considered why we lack amazing relationships? I'm here to tell you our unforgiveness from the past is hindering our relationships now. Your unforgiveness of the past, some of you right now, you are looking at me with a strange eye. You're listening to me with a strange ear. Why? Because some pastor from your past has hurt you and it's keeping you from connecting to me on a relational basis now. Your unforgiveness from the past is hurting you right now. But here's the good news. Can I give you some good news? Jesus makes it clear what biblical forgiveness looks like. Jesus makes it clear what biblical forgiveness looks like. In fact, how does he do it? He uses a parable. Jesus loved to use parable. You're saying, Randy, why does Jesus use a parable to help us to know what biblical forgiveness looks like? Well, he tells us in Matthew 13, 10, and 11, he was asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? And Jesus replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you. And today, God wants to give us secrets to forgiveness. By the way, the reason why they're secrets is because you don't know them. The reason why they're secrets is because they're not readily available. The reason why they're secrets is most churches are ignorant of them. And so read with me, if you would, in Matthew chapter 18, beginning with verse 21, and let's figure out if we can see, if, the, if it'll jump off the page to us, the, the secrets of forgiveness. Verse 21 of Matthew 18 says this, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Therefore, Jesus then kicks into a parable. He kicks into a story with a special meaning. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, Please be patient with me, and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him and released him and forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time, Be patient with me. And I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor, that man, wouldn't wait. He had this guy, the man, arrested and put into prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had just happened. Then the king called called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. And then verse 35 of Matthew 18 is the scariest verse in all the Bible for Christians. And this is what he says. And Jesus says, that's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Do you see it? There's secrets there. He gives us nuggets. He gives us nuggets of truth. If you allow the Spirit, He'll open your mind and help you to see secrets to forgiveness that maybe you've never understood and you never saw before. You're saying, Randy, what secrets are you talking about? Well, secret number one is this. Forgiveness is limitless. Forgiveness is limitless. Go back to verses 21 and 22. Peter said, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Now, if you want me to, I'm probably not going to have time for it today, but I can go into the Hebrew, I can go into the Greek, I can get you into the hermeneutics, I can help you understand, but can you trust me that what Jesus was saying was that forgiveness is limitless? In the Hebrew culture, when somebody said 70 times 7, they were talking about a limitless number. And so Jesus was declaring that our forgiveness is limitless. You're saying, Randy, why in the world would Jesus remove all limits on forgiveness? Why? Because Father God's forgiveness of us has no limit. We see it universally in 1 John 2, 2. 
He says Christ is the means by which our sins are forgiven. Not only our sins, but also the sins of the whole world. But we also see it personally in Colossians 2.13. He says you were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ. How? For he forgave all our sins. Why would Jesus remove all limits from forgiveness? Why would Jesus say, you know what, you, can, you can't say, I'll forgive this, but I won't forgive that. I'll forgive up to this point, but I won't forgive any more. Why would Jesus say that? Why? Because that's how Father God treats us. And what is our job? Ephesians 5.1 says this, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Go back to verse, uh, Ephesians 4.32, he says, forgiving one another just as God has as God through Christ has forgiven you. Write this down if you're taking notes. All forgiveness is based upon what God's done for us. Your forgiveness of others is based. God is the model. God is the author. And so our job is to forgive others as God has forgiven us. Well, what does Colossians 2.13 says? He has forgiven you all sin, past sin, present sin, future sin. You're saying, Randy, he's forgiven even that? Yes, he's forgiven even that. Forgiveness is limitless. That's why, if you want to, you might want to write this down. One of my sayings when it comes to forgiveness is this. you got to forgive like breathing. You've got to forgive like breathing. Why? Because this is what God says to me all the time. Randy, you can stop forgiving when you stop breathing. And so forgiveness is limitless. So that's secret number one. What's secret number two? Secret number two is forgiveness involves a debt. Forgiveness involves a debt. Go back to verses 24 and 27. It says, One of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. Then his master was filled with mercy for him, and he released him and forgave his debt. You see, all sin, when somebody sins against you, the Bible clearly teaches that all sin causes us to owe someone. That's why Jesus says in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, 12, he says, Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Does that mean that I can't have a loan? Does that mean I can't, somebody can't owe me money? That every time somebody owes me money, I've got to forgive them the loan? No, he's talking about another word for debt. What's the definition of debt that he's talking about? It is a charge earned as a result of an offense or sin. It is a charge earned as a result of an offense or sin. And so when he says, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors, he's saying, we forgive those who have done something wrong against us. We have forgive those who owe us something because of the sin in their life. We see it again in Luke eleven four. 4. He says, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone in debt to us. I don't know about you, but this makes, it, it makes a lot of things make sense. For example, when you hear about criminals talking about who have served time, who have been in prison, and they talk about, I've paid my debt to society. What are they recognizing? That when you sin against somebody, you sin against the society, and then when you go to jail and you spend time in prison, you are paying a debt that you owe for the things that you have done wrong. Well, guess what? When people sin against terror, when people sin against us, it results in them owing us a debt. They owe us something. But when she chooses to forgive, when we choose to forgive, it happens when we release them from that debt. You're saying, Randy, why in the world would I ever want to release somebody from the debt? They owe me. They've hurt me. They've done me wrong. Why would I ever want to release them from the debt? Well, Colossians 3.13 says, remember, the Lord forgave you your debt, so you must forgive others. Can I give you my rule? As you can probably tell, if any of you know my story, you know my testimony, I am not standing before you a man without scars. I am not standing before you a man who has not been through. In fact, there was about a 15-year period where it seemed like everybody that I loved and trusted made it their point to betray me. In fact, if I had not learned about forgiveness the way God has taught me, I would have left the ministry I definitely would have never signed up for marriage again. I definitely wouldn't have been around kids anymore because kids are mean. And so can I give you my rule on forgiveness? I can stop forgiving when others have sinned against me more than I've sinned against God. I can stop forgiving when others have sinned against me 
more than I have sinned against God. You're saying, well, Randy, that's going to be good because I, people have sinned against me more than I've sinned against God. Then you are ignorant of your sin. The Bible says, I was conceived in sin. That I came out of the womb with a sin nature. I don't know about you, even though I've been saved for 46 years, going on 47 I can't even make it out of my bedroom in the morning without at least seven heart sins. By the time I make it to my prayer time, and it doesn't take me long to get to my prayer time, by the time I make it to my prayer time, I have to start every morning prayer with this phrase, Oh God, you are good and I am evil. You do nothing but good and my righteousness is as filthy rags. Let me explain something to you. There will never be a person alive that has sinned against you more than you've sinned against God. And so I can stop forgiving when somebody sins against me more than I've sinned against God. And so we see what? Forgiveness is limitless. We see what? Forgiveness involves a debt. But notice secret number three. Secret number three is this. Forgiveness isn't natural. Forgiveness isn't natural. Go back to verse 28. It says, but when the man left the king, I mean, he just walked out. He had just been forgiven of all this money. And the man left the king. He went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. Now think about this for a second. The king, I did the math again this week because it's constantly changing because it's based upon the price of silver. The king had just forgiven this man approximately $280 million. Write that down. $280 million. And this gentleman owed him a few thousand. Yet forgiveness still didn't come easily. Why? Oh, we're so selfish. We are depraved. We are narcissistic. Isaiah 64, 6 says, We are all infected and impure with sin when we display our righteous deeds. They are nothing but filthy rags. By the way, you know, how that, you know what that explains? That explains how some of y'all can come in here. You'll come to the altar. You'll drop down to your knees. You will receive the grace and the mercy and forgiveness of God. You'll walk out that door. You'll get in the car, and you'll grab somebody in your family by the throat and demand that they owe you something. I've heard of more more fights in this parking lot after these services. Why? How in the world can we receive such great forgiveness? How in the world can we receive such great mercy and then walk right out the door, get on the phone and blow somebody up? Why? We're selfish, we're depraved, we're narcissistic, we're egotistical, we are bad people. And so please remember this, please remember this. Forgiveness will always be a choice. Forgiveness will always be a choice. Look at 2 Corinthians 2 7. It says, You should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrows. Did you see that? Forgiveness means we choose to turn away from our anger and we turn to forgiveness. We choose to forgive. Let's go ahead and settle this. Write this down. You'll never feel like forgiven. There's never going to be a day that you wake up and you, when your spouse hurts you or your children hurt you or your neighbor hurts you or your coworker hurts you, there's never going to be a day that your natural response is, oh, I'm just going to be a forgive. By the way, if you are doing that, if that is natural, then you're probably not forgiven biblically. I'm firmly convinced that what most people call forgiveness is really denial. Oh, let's just sweep it under the rug. Oh, it's just water under the bridge. Let's pretend like it didn't happen until I get mad, and then I'm going to pull the rug back, and I'm going to take your sin, and I'm going to throw it in your face because I haven't forgiven. That's not what it is. Forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is a choice. You're saying, Randy, how do you know? Well, go back again. It's, it's all based upon what God's done for us. Think about this for a second. Jesus, maybe you, don't, you haven't read the Scriptures, But the Bible says Jesus was beaten and battered and bruised before the cross so bad that even his mama didn't recognize him. He then gets a crown of thorns with thorns that long, that long, and and they were ground on his head. And then he was stripped down naked in front of millions of people. Then he had nails nailed through his feet and through his hands. And then he was lifted high on the cross and made a mockery of. And, And people were gambling for his clothes. The same people that had just beat him. The same people that had just spit on him. The same people that had just treated him with contempt. They were mocking him and they were gambling for his clothes. Now, do you think that Jesus felt like forgiving? But what does the Bible say he did? Father, forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing. Now let me go ahead and be real clear. They're never going to know what they're doing to you. 
Some of you keep telling me, Randy, if they would just understand how much they hurt, they'll never know. Just like you'll never know how much you've hurt God with your pornography. They'll never know how much you've hurt God with your stealing. They'll never know how much you've hurt God with your lust. They don't know. They'll never know. So stop waiting for them to know. Just make the choice to forgive. To be like Jesus. And so we see that forgiveness is what? It is limitless. There's never going to be a time when you're not called on to forgive. Forgiveness involves a debt. There's, there's always going to be a you letting go of what they owe you. Forgiveness is also isn't natural. It's supernatural. It's a gift from God. But notice secret number four. Forgiveness is serious. If you've happened to fall asleep, this might be the time to wake up. Elbow the person beside you. Tell them it's getting ready to get good. Go back to verses 32 and 34. The king says, you evil servant. Who's the evil servant? The guy that refused to forgive. A few thousand dollars. You evil servant, shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. By the way, what's he talking about there? Who got sent to prison? Who got sent to, to, to torture? The man that refused to forgive. And just to make sure that we, we don't get confused, Jesus says in verse 35, and that's what my heavenly Father will do to you. Who? Those who refuse to forgive. What's did he do? He, he sends us to prison. He tortures us if we refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters. Now, do me a favor. Name another sin like has that consequences. Come on, Bible scholars. Name another sin... Where the Bible says, if you commit it, that God the Father is going to send a tormenting, torturing spirit down upon you until you do it. I, I did some, re some research. If you steal, the Bible's prescription is to pay back four to five times. If you commit adultery, you don't get tortured. The Bible's prescription for adultery is death. Boy, that would settle a lot of things, wouldn't it? <laughs> if you, what? If you lie... On the witness stand, if you lie about somebody publicly, trying to get them in trouble, anybody's got kids, you know exactly what he's talking about, then God's prescription is to do to that kid what he wanted done to his brother or sister. Right? How about division in the church? We take that seriously. God says, kick them out. I don't know of any other sin that Christians can commit that results in a holy God promising to send them to prison, which means what? To isolate them. And then torment them day and night till they can pay their debt. By the way, you think you can pay your debt to God? So the torment and the torture goes on and on and on and on. You see, forgiveness is serious. And it's up to us because it's a choice. We forgive. The choice is this. Forgive or be tormented. I'm talking to you, spouse. Either forgive them. Or you're choosing torment. I'm talking to you, kid. Forgive your parents or be tormented. I'm talking to you, employee. Forgive your coworker, forgive your boss, or be tormented. I'm talking to you, church. Forgive your former pastors, forgive your former church people, forgive the church people that you're sitting beside, or face torment. I know what you're thinking. You're going, well, my God, I love the phrase. My God wouldn't do that. 1 Samuel 18.10 says this, The very next day, a tormenting spirit from God overwhelmed Saul. By the way, he liked Saul. Saul was his king. He chose him. What do you think he's going to do to you? You see, forgiveness is serious. Forgiveness isn't natural. Forgiveness involves a debt. Forgiveness is limitless, but please don't miss this. Please don't make the same mistake this your pastor made and not know secret number five. And it was a secret to me for year, and that is for years, and that is forgiveness is emotional. Forgiveness is emotional. Jesus concludes his parable by saying this in verse 35: Forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. What's he saying there? He's reminding us that forgiveness is incomplete when it only affects our mind, when it only affects our thoughts. We must let forgiveness free our emotions as well. You're saying, Randy, you made this mistake? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Have you ever been in ministry? 
Have you ever been paid to do ministry? Because there's something about tr- when money changes hands that you go from being that, I, I went from being that volunteer that everybody loved because he was doing things that nobody else wanted to do working with teenagers. But the second I got paid, the second somebody paid me to do full-time ministry, I immediately started getting treated like trash. Every Sunday, every week, since 1989, church people treated me like dirt. And while I was very quick, because again, I wouldn't be in ministry today after all these years. I wouldn't be in ministry if I hadn't learned how to forgive. And, and so I was really quick to forgive people's actions. I would forgive their lying. I'd forgive their hatefulness. I'd forgive their meanness. I'd forgive, I forgave their actions, yet it, I, I did not deal with the emotions. And after a while, I started getting what I called gut sick. You know what I'm talking about? Have you ever been around somebody? That's hurt you, and every time you see them, every time you hear their name, every time you think about them, you get that sick feeling in your gut. Some of you are sitting beside somebody that does that to you. I understand. What happened? I forgave what they did. I didn't forgive the resulting emotions, the humiliation, the aggravation, the frustration, the irritation, the hopelessness, the despair. I mean, think about it. These people had my livelihood in their hands. They were threatening to take food off of my kid's table. They were threatening to cause problems for my marriage. They were attacking me financially. And I forgave the stuff, but I didn't forgive from the heart. And guess what? It led to bitterness. I became bitter at the church. I I remember saying, I, I was in a meeting with other youth ministers and this is what i said out loud how bad did it have to be for me to say this out loud i said i love the ministry except for the people is there any ministry without people i mean are you missing this there is the, you know i can't minister if you ain't here right i don't minister to chairs but i literally and i'm so thankful that the leader of the meeting looked at me and went whoa And he immediately walked over to me, put his hand on my neck, and said, you and I are going to lunch, whether you want to or not. (laughs) You see, there's a reason why Hebrews says in 1215, Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. By the way, do you have uncontrollable emotions with certain people? Do you have that kid that could just push your buttons? Do you have that coworker that you just have to avoid? Do you have that person that every time you think about them, you just go, oh, you're Tasmanian devil? <laughs> Might I suggest that those are all signs of an unforgiving heart? And here's what let me warn you. This has been so cool since Jennifer's had Naomi for the last two and a half years. Jennifer always knew in theory that sin was bad. Jennifer always knew in theory that sin, you know, had consequences. But only since we've had Naomi, because I don't know if you know this, Naomi is, is little Jennifer, <laughs> right? She's just a, that whole version. I mean, they, they talk the same. They laugh the same. They, won't, they wake up talking. They go to bed talking. They don't hush in between. Y'all act like I talk a lot in my home. There's not a lot of room. Me and, Jay, me and Jessica just do head nods to each other because there's no, there's no break. Well, this is what Jennifer has noticed since Naomi's been born. She's always been serious about the sin in her life. But now what she notices is this. When she sins, when she rebels against God, she rebels against her husband, she rebels immediately corrupts Naomi, and Naomi starts rebelling. And can I share something with your parent? Say you won't forgive for yourself. You're, you're just willing to take being tormented and tortured. It says that it, what? Your bitterness is corrupting many, including your children. You see, you're willing to go to church out of guilt But if you're bitter at the church, your children are going to say, as soon as I'm 18, I ain't doing that. Why? Because I am not going to go through what my parents went through. Your unforgiveness is corrupting your children. 
and your grandchildren. It's corrupting your friendships, your relationships. You see, bitterness doesn't stay in our heart. It just comes out. So do me a favor. I don't know about you, but even though I thought I'd dealt with everything getting ready to come into this sermon, God's already been hitting me while I'm in preaching of other things I've got to forgive. And so why don't you do me a favor? Bow your heads, close your eyes, every head bow. Every eye closed. You're saying, Randy, why do you want me to bow my head, close my eyes? Why? Because there's really only two people that matter in this room right now, not the person beside you, not the person. It's just you and God. And right now, you need to do some business with God because this is serious. You're getting ready to walk out of here with a tormenting spirit on you, and you can't rebuke that spirit because it ain't the devil. This is from God, and you can do all you want to. It won't go away. And so the first thing i got to ask you, though, is this. Before we get into all this other stuff, Please, hear me. Don't let your mind wander. Hear me. Has your debt to God been paid? Has your debt to God been paid? You see, one or two people are going to pay your debt to God. And by the way, if you think that people owe you stuff because of their sin, think about all the debt you have to God for your sin. And has that been paid? And the Bible says that Jesus came to pay your debt on the cross. He rose again on the third day. He is seated at the right hand of the God. He came to pay your debt. He's offered to pay your debt. He's willing to say, hey, you don't have to die for your sin. You don't have to go to hell for your sin. I did that for you. But when did that transaction take place? You see, you don't evolve into it. You don't stumble into it. It has to be a choice. You have to choose to forgive, but you also have to choose to receive forgiveness. And can I wonder, is the reason why you struggle with forgiveness is because you've never been fully forgiven yourself? It's because you've never accepted the forgiveness of God? You see, people who don't have forgiveness can't give it away. People who have never received forgiveness can never give it away. When was that time? When was that moment? Right here, right now, you do understand salvation, that forgiveness is just a start. For Jesus to fully pay your debt, you've got to, re- you've got to believe into him. You've got to let him be in charge. You've got to let him kill the old you, give you a new you. You've got to let him do that heart transplant. That's the whole point of salvation. And so today, if you're willing, say, oh God, I give up, I surrender Take this wicked, depraved, selfish heart, bitter heart, unforgiving heart, and fill me with your heart that forgives even my enemies. It can happen right here. It can happen right now. Just talk to them. Just say what's on your heart right now. Let me pray for you. Oh, God, I lift up everyone here. Lord, I don't want Easter to be wasted. I I want them to experience the, the results of forgiveness. Lord, I want them to have their debt paid. So, oh God, be with whoever today needs to hear this. Give them the desire and the power, the faith, the humility to call on you and be saved. So that then, Lord, as we receive the forgiveness that you've so graciously given us, we can then give it away. Oh God, we need you. We're desperate for you. It's in Jesus' name I pray.